Folks are still uh, signing up, so we'll just we'll sure. start very shortly. Okay, why don't we uh, why don't we get going? Uh, hopefully, you can uh, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, my name is uh, Jim Wonderman. I'm the president and CEO of the Bay Area Council, uh, and it's an honor to be. Uh, uh, opening up the opportunity for all summit. A lot of work has gone into this uh, to make this happen today. It's a really important conversation and we're pleased that uh, many folks have uh, taken the opportunity to join. Uh, I wanna start by thanking Kaiser Permanente for sponsoring this, this uh, event. Uh, Kaiser continues to show its unwavering commitment uh, to equity by supporting educational events like this. Uh, supporting the Prop 16 campaign and investing in programs throughout the community uh, that serve uh, all people. We thank you for your leadership and uh, you're a company that models uh, stewardship and uh, it's a pleasure to be involved with Kaiser Permanente. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the extremely painful context in which we are here today and having this conversation. Uh, the deeply shocking uh, tragic killings of George Floyd, of Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, Richard Brooks, and many others have rocked the nation and brought our country's pervasive history of racism and oppression of black Americans uh, to the forefront uh, once again. Uh, racial, racial injustices like these sadly are not new, uh, but for the first time in a long time, Americans from all walks of life are standing up to say black lives matter and we're not going to stand for racial injustice of any kind. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a white white guy. Given this message, and um, you know, I I know a little bit about this subject, but I don't know that much about it. I'm learning, uh, like a lot of people, and uh, we're going to be hearing from some people today who know an awful lot about it and have an awful lot of great context to provide. But I would say it's good uh, that white people are talking. I think that's part of the object of this effort. And so, in that regard, uh, I'm really pleased to be able to take take part in this. Um, the widespread national movement against racial injustice we have seen focuses uh, much on policing and the criminal justice systems, but it really expands to all aspects of life where, ra where racism and injustice and discriminations are still occurring, very much, much so. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a controversial policy, affirmative action, which seeks to combat historic and pervasive discrimination and inequity within our public institutions. Uh, the Bay Area Council's executive committee voted unanimously to support Proposition 16, uh, which would overturn finally California's ban on affirmative action, uh, because we see it as an important policy tool to correct long ignored racial inequities uh, in our state. And today we will hear from experts on affirmative action in California. Uh, Lydia Chavez, who wrote the book on affirmative action in California called The Colorbind, California's Battle to End Affirmative Action and taught at the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism and is the founder and executive editor of Mission Local, a news site that covers the Mission District here in San Francisco. We're also joined by Assembly Member Shirley Weber of Southern California. She's the author of ACA 5, which enabled Proposition 16 uh, to appear on the ballot. Uh, this year, Assembly Member Weber authored two other racial justice bills that were just signed into law this week. Congratulations. AB 3121, which establishes a nine member task force to inform Californians about slavery and explore ways the state might pay reparations, as well as AB 3070, which would strengthen jury selection procedures and increase transparency to ensure attorney challenges to exclude jurors are not for discriminatory purposes. We'd love to hear more about those bills as well, if time permits today. I want to thank both of you for uh, taking the opportunity to be here with us. Uh, we'll also be hearing about the campaign from, uh, the, from uh, campaign leaders before we close with an exciting panel of professional sports leaders who've spoken out on affirmative action and Proposition 16. As you've seen on the news, uh, major sports teams increasingly are speaking out against racial injustice and in an unprecedented move, all of the Bay Area's major sports teams jointly came out in support of Proposition 16. We are really excited to see that and hence invited them to participate. And today we will hear from uh, Stephen Aldrich, who's the chair of the Oakland, uh, uh, Oakland Roots, 
uh, Larry Baer, the president and CEO of the San Francisco Giants, uh, Jared Shawley, the COO of the San Jose Earthquakes, and Jed York, the CEO of the San Francisco 49ers, about their decision to make this joint statement of support and how business leaders can take a stand for racial justice to support a more equitable society for everyone. A few of the teams couldn't be here today due to games and scheduling uh, conflicts, but we're very excited to have these leaders join us today to discuss how we can uh, be better allies. On that regard, I should congratulate the Oakland uh, A's. Uh, Dave Cobble was planning to join this panel today, but uh, it, it was unavailable to do so as a result of, of uh, the A's schedule. Remember the Q&A box is open, so send our panelists your questions uh, during the course of the event, and we'll do, do our very, very best to get through them. And with that, uh, we want to get to the first panel. And for that purpose, I'm going to kick it over to uh, Leslie Alfaroff. She is a policy associate from the Bay Area Council team. Uh, she is uh, absolutely terrific and has put a, a tremendous amount of effort uh, into making this happen today. So uh, uh, Leslie is going to uh, introduce our first panel and uh, take it away. Thank you, Jim. Um, I believe we are still waiting for Assembly Member Weber, but we will go ahead and start the introductions until she gets to join us. So today I am uh, really excited to be uh, moderating this discussion with uh, Professor Lydia Chavez and Assembly Member Weber. Um, we are going to be discussing the overall uh, history of affirmative action in California. Um, like Jim said, I am a policy associate with the Bay Area Council, working primarily on our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, as well as on our workforce of the future committee. Um, and I'm just really excited uh, for the conversation that we're going to be having. Um, so first we have Lydia Chavez, who is the executive director and founder of Mission Local. Uh, she is the author of The Colorblind, California's Battle Against Affirmative Action. Professor Chavez has also worked at the Albuquerque Tribune, the Time Magazine, the LA Times, the New York Times, uh, where she served as El Salvador and South American Bureau Chief. She also taught at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism until the spring of 2018. Uh, Mission Local is a new site covering the Mission District that began in Berkeley in the fall of 2008 and became independent in the summer of 2014. Assembly Member Weber was elected in November of 2012 to represent California's 79th Assembly District, which Bonita Chula Vista, La Mesa, Lemon Grove, National City, and San Diego. In her time as assembly member, she has been a champion for the rights of constituents, including sponsoring bills to reform the criminal justice system, improve the education system, and ensure people have access uh, to support services they need. As Jim mentioned, she authored ACA 5 to enable Proposition 16 to be on the ballot, as well as the bill which creates a task force that will inform Californians about slavery and explore the ways which the state might provide reparations. She attended UCLA where she received her BA, MA, and PhD by the age of 26. Dr. Weber has been a professor at California State University of Los Angeles, Los Angeles City College, and San Diego State University. Uh, so really excited to have um, both of them on or soon to have both of them on. Um, so while we wait for Dr. Um, I mean, Shirley Weber, uh, why don't we go ahead and start with uh, Professor Lydia Chavez. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. I think you wanted me to give you some of the background on Prop 209, what was happening in California. And it's important. It's really important background to know because Proposition 209 was essentially the child or the result of two forces coming together in 1994. The culture wars of the 1980s that produced 209's two authors, Tom Wood and Glenn Custard, and the incredible success of the anti-immigrant Proposition 187 which became political gold for the state Republican party in 1994 and eventually the model for 209. So let me explain. Through the 1980s, we all watched the culture wars of the 1980s, the you know, demonstrations on campus, the desire to change the you know, basic curriculum and the core reading lists, faculties were shifting and this it was all in tumult. And Glenn Custard, 
watched these changes where he taught at Hayward. He was a tenured professor there. A, the student body changed there and so did the faculty. And as the faculty changed and began to want these changes, he felt more akin to those who wanted to push back on the changes and to keep the changes. And he joined something called the California Association of Scholars, which was the state chapter of the National Association of Scholars, which was formed in 1987 to protect Western intellectual heritage. So it was a group of conservative uh, professors throughout the country who organized to prevent the changes. At the same time that, you know, Custard was on the inside and watched these changes, Tom Wood was on the outside. He had finished his PhD at Berkeley. He could not get a tenure track job. And no matter that more white men were hired in the time that he was looking for a ten track job, he began to associate his own failed job search with affirmative action. And he also joined the California Association of Scholars and that's where he met Custard. They met, they both you know, wanted to work against affirmative action and they began working on an initiative. And they tried to get the first initiative on the ballot in 1992, but there wasn't that much interest across the country and in California, there is still, I think, majority interest for affirmative action. But if you start talking about preferences or racial quotas, the, the, uh, the interest and the support just goes way down. So they knew this and they had failed their first time around. And then in 1993, they started to watch what was happening with Governor Wilson. I don't know if any of you remember, but Pete Wilson at that time was going to be up for re-election. Only 15% of the voters, I think it was an all-time low, wanted to return him to office. And he began to blame the state was just coming out of a really horrendous uh, recession. And he began to blame that recession on immigrants. Immigrants were, it was too much for the state. Uh, they were costing us too much. They were taking jobs. And this kind of soundbite just really played well at that time. I mean, people were scared, people were losing their jobs. And you know, what always happens in those situations is people look for someone to blame and undocumented immigrants were an easy target. At the same time, Proposition 187 came into being and this was in proposition from the get-go. Everyone knew that this was going to be thrown out by the courts because it forbid all services, medical education to immigrants, undocumented immigrants. But Wilson embraced it and he rode that all the way to the polls. I mean, as soon as he embraced it and as soon as the Democrats began to oppose it and oppose it strongly, their poll numbers, Kathleen Brown had been ahead in the polls and she just went whoa, way down and Wilson just shot up. And at the end of the day on 1994, I think the Republicans had lost every major office in the state. And it was really because of this ballot initiative. They had found the perfect wedge issue. It's a wedge issue is something will, that will separate, you know, the Democrats from their sort of natural con constituency. And it's a very, very emotional issue. I mean, I had my own experience with it, which if we have time, I can tell you, but it was such a win and it was white male voters that Wilson won on. So everyone right after that, you know, in politics began looking around for the next big wedge issue. And lo and behold, you know, Wood and Custard were out there again, going to try their initiative and people picked up on it. And everyone started writing about how white male voters were going to be against affirmative action and this was the perfect wedge issue to latch Democrats onto and possibly even a model in the 1996 presidential election, possibly getting Wilson into the White House. So you had those two things, the culture wars and this experience in 1994 come together and that's how 209 in 1995, 1996 takes off. Um, should I go on? 
Yeah, so it seems like what you're saying is that it was really the like perfect environment, right? There was a lot of fear that was happening and there was just the like right time, everything was bubbling up. Um, yeah. So how does that relate to kind of what's happening now? Like why has, um, why do you think it might be time this time well, around for it to be overturned? Yeah, let me just go back up to a little bit of the, more of the history. So in so in early 1995, everyone thought that Custard and Wood were onto something. Clinton called for a whole review of affirmative action. And this is also important in terms of understanding what's happening now. So Clinton calls for a review of affirmative action program. Dole, who was supposed to be expected to be the uh, presidential candidate, pulled back. He had long supported affirmative action and he switched on it. And so this campaign, this initiative, this idea is in the press weekly, if not daily. I mean, it just became a huge issue. And the polls showed then, you know, as I said before, that a majority of people supported affirmative action, but if you wrote about it as preferences or quotas, they hated it. So this became, you know, the, the way in which the initiative was written, it doesn't even mention affirmative action. It only talks about a preferences. And the state attorney general, you know, asked them to rewrite it, said that it had to be rewritten. They went to court and the court upheld the original language. So they, they had a very, very difficult time. Um, what's interesting is it, it still, it played very big in the California elections that year as a wedge issue, but it did not play nationally. It became sort of difficult nationally. Uh, everyone became a little bit afraid of it because there is overall support for affirmative action. So Dole pulled back. Clinton did, he supported it very mildly. No one just went hot on it as they had gone hot on 187 before. Um, but I see that uh, Assemblyman Weber, Dr. Weber is with us now. So maybe we should Yes, go. welcome Assembly Member Weber. We're so excited to have you here. Uh, Professor Chavez was just kind of giving us a little bit of the history of Proposition 209 and what was happening in California in the 90s that allowed it to be passed. Um, but we do want to kick it back over to you as one of the co-authors of the uh, original bill that is allowing uh, Proposition 16 to be put on the ballot. You know, we really want to start out with kind of the basics on um, what is affirmative action, what your bill does, and how it would undo some of the stuff that uh, Prop 209 has done. Sure. Thank you, first of all, for, for inviting me to be here. Uh, there are lots of things going on at the same time. But, um, um, you know, I'm the author of uh, AB, uh, ACA 5, which was the uh, constitutional amendment bill that basically, uh, with two thirds vote, allowed us to put affirmative action uh, on the calendar and to, um, uh, excuse me, on the ballot this coming November. And so it comes on, on the ballot as Proposition 16. Um, but um, this has been a discussion that we've had for many, many years about how do we reverse Proposition 209? How do we change the narrative? How do we get past some of the misinformation and help people to understand? Um, when Proposition 209 was placed on the ballot, um, you know, years ago, uh, I don't think people knew how devastating it would be in terms of its ban on any consideration of race or gender in anything that we do. Most folks thought, okay, well, you know, it's there, but uh, it won't have, its, it's, it's uh, impact could be very limited in terms of just as a statement that we don't believe in discrimination. Um, but that, you know, that statement itself uh, is in the constitution and it's in California's constitution. And, and so we don't have discrimination anyway. So it's kind of a fortuitous kind of statement to be made. But what it did was it, 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 it banned the use of any consideration of race or gender in, in education, contracting and employment, which meant it took away the ability to outreach and to have incentives for recruitment of individuals in different areas. Or even, and, and, and because affirmative action was never uh, mandated by law, it was always permissive that states could do it, counties could do it, cities could do it. And oftentimes based on your population where you were, you would want to change the, the dynamics of who was doing work and those kinds of things. Or our university would want to engage in various outreach programs that are there. So uh, the, the atmosphere was horrible in California in the 90s with uh, Pete Wilson as governor. Uh, Pete Wilson um, 
uh, took upon himself to try to figure out how he was going to get to the White House, pretty much like uh, Donald Trump in terms of fomenting uh, hatred against groups of people, you know, not wanting us to provide health services for people who may be here who were in, in the United States and ill but weren't, quote, citizens. They couldn't get health care. He didn't want us to actually educate folks who were, who were not supposed to be here. They tried to put a ban on, on, on bilingual education. And so it went on and on, and it fomented a lot of hate amongst groups in California. And he thought that would ride him into the White House. He really did. Uh, I knew a lot of folks who were real big Pete Wilson fans here in San Diego, African-Americans who were longstanding friends of his and came back after his swearing in so angry they couldn't see straight because he invited them there. They sat on the front row and his opening speech was just filled with all the stuff he was gonna do and take away from people of color. And uh, those folks were, 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 uh, were, were insulted. And I said, but did you express your insult? And they go, well, no. I said, you should have got up, turned a chair over, cursed a few words and walked out. I said, that would at least say to him, you do this if you want to, but you don't have our support. And um, so he began that whole process. And, 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 and so what, is, what, what, it, uh, what 209 did was it took away any opportunity we had to try to level the playing field. That's what it was. And it was not, you couldn't get a job because of Prop 209. You didn't get in the universities because of Prop 209. But it gave uh, the universities and, and, and other places an opportunity to try to correct some of the errors of the past and provide some level of support for individuals to be able to adequately compete. Um, we didn't realize the impact it would have until after it was passed. And, and, and I fought against it. I must I don't know how many debates I was on at UCSD and everywhere else fighting against Proposition 209. Um, but in, when it passed, we immediately had to dismantle a significant number of things. I was on the school board. Uh, and, and, and one of the things that we had put on the school board was a program to help young African-American males who were failing in our schools. Issues of self-esteem, issues of racism, this, this, this. And so we said, how can we help these boys? There are only 30 of them that had a beer better average in a, in a district that is the second largest district in California at the time, 120,000 students. Um, so we developed a program where we hired five, four African-American males uh, to mentor these kids and they developed mentorship programs. They brought in role models. They did all kinds of things. And in about a, in less than a couple of years, we had gone from like 30 kids with a be a better average to over 500 kids in city schools, uh, young males who had positive self-esteem, who were engaged, who, who were getting after school support and, and the teachers were getting some training about it. So it was highly focused on black males. When affirmative, when affirmative action came in, we had to dismantle that program. We could not have a program just to help those kids who were in need. So we ended up having a program that was for everybody. So we took these four people, scattered them across the city uh, for 120,000 kids, and we saw the results immediately begin to decline. We did the same thing for Latinas who had some issues of self-esteem. We did the same thing with Hmong children. So we were basically looking at our problems and trying to address those issues. And because of that, uh, we violated Prop 209. And we can no longer do that. We can no longer do specific outreach in areas. We couldn't do um, STEM programs for, for young girls in the school district. Nonprofits started doing that in other organizations, but to have something in our schools that really promoted uh, young girls in the field of STEM would have been an amazing thing to help overcome a problem. So, so, so what happened was it, 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 Prop 209 put a ban on any consideration despite the fact that the Supreme Courts have already said, you can use that as one of your many variables because they tried to knock it down at Harvard when Harvard wants a diverse population. And so what happens that many of our universities began to realize this, they started working to do various things. And so our numbers started going up a little. But initially, uh, just the admissions in med school and law school, I remember I spoke the very last year that at, at UCLA's graduate, black graduation when they were, uh, when all that was gonna be done away with. And the fact that as a result of that, uh, not only was it gonna be done away with, uh, we didn't, um, we, we could no longer recruit students the way we had done before. And so this was their last one. And, and, and we had told at that graduation that there would be, I think maybe one black person admitted to law school and none admitted to med school, okay? And I remember when my daughter was getting ready to go to med school in 2000, um, she came to UC Davis for an interview. And she decided she wouldn't, didn't want to come to California to go to med school because she would have been the only black person in the med school class at UC Davis. So she chose to go to Rochester. Excellent program, the Helix program at, at Rochester, University of Rochester, because 
I think a third of their class were women and minorities in the med school. In her mind, in her world, that was, that was relevant and that was important. And they were recruiting our students like crazy all over. Everybody who had an affirmative action program were recruiting our students with the understanding you get these students there at your, in your state and your city, you more than likely after graduation will keep, them. you know, they'll become the professionals that are there. I went to, I didn't get admitted to San UCLA on affirmative action because it didn't come in until after I was already admitted and, and, and present. But I did get into a program called GAP, the Graduate Advancement Program that was specifically started to attract African-Americans and Latinos into med school, I mean, into graduate school, because we weren't going there. And, 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 and I had never thought about you know, that that much, but eventually when I became a Woodrow Wilson Fellow, it was at that point that, and I'm, I'm confident that I became a Woodrow Wilson Fellow because of affirmative action, you know, because they looked at my full record of who I was and realized when I went to UCLA coming out of South Central LA, I had a lot of adjustments to make. But I made the adjustments, and by the time I was a sophomore and a junior, I was rolling. You know, I was doing extremely well. Uh, it took, it, but but those things, uh, you know, because the playing field was not level, and so to go to grad school when you when you're a person of color and you have it, and all your faculty are white, who may not necessarily take you under their wings, and it's a very personal experience. Um, it, it, it's it's not an easy thing to do to enter a doctoral program. Uh, at, at, it wasn't at that time, and probably still not today. And so, specific programs like the GAP program was designed to attract so many of us to UCLA to, to graduate school, uh, to help us to provide uh, mentors in terms of faculty. We still had to take the test. We still had to take the class. We still had to pass everything that was there. So, props, Prop 209 prevented us all that stuff from happening. And as a result, we saw the decline in not only admissions, but professional schools and what have you. So, it, it, so we've been working for a number of years to try to bring uh, this uh, Proposition 16 to the ballot. And we've met with lots of different obstacles and people didn't feel it would happen. I know when, uh, when they had um, uh, Ed Hernandez bill, it got killed at the leadership level because they were afraid that this would get out and a lot of folks wouldn't get reelected and, and so forth. And so it was being, at every step it was being stopped. Uh, when we proposed ACA 5, I have to be very honest that their leadership in both houses was not in support of ACA 5, okay? They, they were afraid that one, we wouldn't get it out, that we wouldn't get two thirds vote, and therefore people would be exposed, okay? And as a result, uh, would, it would affect their election. So there was a lot, there's a lot of politics around all this stuff. And so, uh, and then others told us it wouldn't be success. You know, you get this stuff and so, I just decided, regardless of come hell or high water, we're pushing this through. Some of the other caucuses were like, ah, oh, I don't know. Black caucus like, what the hell? You know, we've been slaves. We can deal with this. And so we just pushed it through. And the black caucus hung in, and eventually the others decided, okay, we got to go because they had put us on the hardest committee to get out of, and we needed four votes, and we were struggling with three. And we and most of the other two Dems had said, I think I've done enough for black people. Well, I'm not sure if, if, if the others will get mad at us, if whites will get mad because now we're, we're exposing this racism that's there in the midst of all of this. So we fought, um, and, and, and interestingly enough, <clears throat> I had one Republican who had told me he did not want this bill to die and that he would probably vote for it, maybe, you know, in the committee. So I went to committee that morning with three votes and I needed four because there's seven members on the committee and I only had three. But I called Black Caucus that night and they got on the phone with everybody and they were calling and doing what they had to do. So that morning, I finally had four votes. But my Republican friend decided he was gonna speak for the bill anyway. I told him, I said, you don't have to vote. I know your constituents will be furious. He said, okay, I just, thanks for letting me know. I like to know when I'm falling on a live grenade and you know, that one of those kind of comments and we laughed. He was the first person to speak. And when he voted for it, the other Democrats fell in line because they didn't want to be insulted by a Republican. They wanted, didn't want to be exposed by a Republican in terms of not being in favor of the bill. So to everybody's surprise, we got out of, we got out of the first committee on a six to one vote. And that set the, 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 the plan in place in terms of how we were going to do this. Because once that happened and it, got, and it was going to go to the floor, people realized that this thing just might have legs, you know, that it might get through. That, that two thirds wasn't maybe hard, but not unreasonable. And sure enough, the night, the week, night before, I was calling everybody because of the fact that you can't talk to people personally because we're, we're at a distance thing. We called everybody we could. And I was beating on the doors of everybody that was there. And I was telling them, call this person. I was sending information out, you know, I was working it because I was determined to get at least two thirds vote. And when I got to the Capitol that morning, uh, cause I really didn't get much leadership support for this thing, being very honest. Um, 
they want to know, do you have two thirds? And, and when I walked in, that was the number one question. I said, I believe I have two thirds, if not more. I said, because we have worked this and my numbers add up to be two thirds or more. Uh, we end up with 75% in assembly, and which, which laid a, 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 an, a, an aha, like, oh my God, these people are moving this bill, you know? And, uh, and so we moved to the next house. And, and fortunately we had greater support by now because once you get 75% and, and, the, and the assembly has taken its stand, the Senate's don't wanna be embarrassed. They don't wanna kill affirmative action. You know, they don't wanna kill it. And so as a result, we were able to move them uh, to get two thirds vote as well. So it came out and, and but it's been, a, it's been a journey. It's been a journey because no one expected it. And, and I have to say that, you know, uh, this was introduced before Dave, George Ford, but clearly George Floyd was, was some of the winds beneath our wings. Because what happened, as I pointed out to people on the floor of the assembly, I dreaded having to have a conversation with them because I'm constantly trying to tell them that racism is real, that it impacts people's lives and that we have to do something to create the equal, equal opportunity for everyone. I said, but you get tired of saying that over and over to a bunch of folks who are kind of, okay, maybe this time naysayers halfway in, halfway out, okay. George Floyd was a clear example that racism is still alive because people were shocked that a person could put their knee in somebody's neck for almost nine minutes and watch them die and feel no sense of remorse. That this whole issue is real and that there are unequal communities and unequal experiences in this nation that we have to reckon with. And, uh, and as a result of that, we were able to move. We were able to move um, this bill uh, on, on, the, uh, on the Senate floor. By that time we had the support of we once again, as I said, two thirds vote, uh, and it made quite a difference in terms of those who were who were who were a part of us. That um, that this now has life, and those who had hesitations in the various communities begin to realize that this is the time. That this is the time, and so we're still pushing this agenda. Uh, we've been fortunate to get most of the newspaper, as you know, editorials to bless this, and we've gotten most of the large chambers as well as the statewide chamber, which is unusual because they were the ones who were opposed to affirmative action uh, and, and were in favor of 209 years ago. So we've turned that corner with them uh, in terms of it. And I think what happened is people realized that after 24 years of this particular thing, that it hasn't spread across the nation, it's, it's still confined to eight, nine states that don't allow affirmative action. That when we look at it, we have basically not done extremely well. We still have uh, opportunity gaps all over the place and no real ability to address it. And so the numbers in businesses have plummeted. Uh, in San Diego, women and minorities were doing 30 and 40% every year of the contracts in the city in the 90s. When I became chair of CEOC in 2010, it was one and a half percent for all minorities and women combined. So white men got 98% plus on all contracts and any effort we made to try to level the playing field or open up opportunities or do different kinds of outreach, they sued us for it. They sued us because they had 98 and a half percent and they didn't want to share any more than that. And, um, and the same is true in LA and everywhere else in terms of contracting, equal opportunity and access. Uh, we put at, we're at quite a disadvantage in terms of being able to, to change the narrative. Uh, LA is 2% for women, 2% for Chicanos, and less than 1% for Black people. So white males in LA get 95% plus in terms of contracting. Uh, so this is, this is an extremely important issue. I hope I've given you enough information about the past and what it does. We're excited about it because what it does, it, it, unlike what people say, well, it's, a, it's discriminatory, it's this, is that, it does what we need to do, which is equity which talks about how do you level the playing field so that people who've had certain experiences in life are given an opportunity to be successful. They still have to pass the test, they still have to compete, but how do we, how do we create some sense of level playing field that becomes so important as we look at all the things that we have to do in order to um, get people to the point where they can, can compete and where California is actually meeting the needs of all of its citizens rather than just some of it. To say this is a, 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 a meritorious kind of uh, experience is ridiculous. I just wanna say one last thing, because people don't remember this about our opponent. When this issue came up in terms of uh, the universities and, and all the things that were gonna happen, we, uh, University of California was one of the main Pearson groups pushing Prop 209. Uh, and yet they had preferential treatments for the, trust, for the Board of Trustees. A board of trustees, the University of California can get any relative, friend, or whomever they want admitted to the University of California. 
it, regardless of what, what their test scores might be or their grade point average. They have that opportunity and that privilege, and that's a preference that they get. Well, that was brought to the attention of Mr. Uh, of, of our opponent. And, um, and he said, and so he went to the board of trustees and said, you know, this is hypocritical. We, we want to take away this outreach to, to people who are poor and so forth and so on. Yet we, we have the opportunity to put anybody in we want. We should be fair and not have preferential treatment for the board of trustees. And they said, well, you, you're correct. But let's focus on this first and we'll deal with that after the election. Okay. So we kept hammering that. And of course, they, they didn't want to deal with it until after the election. When, after Prop 209 passed, the first meeting of the Board of Regents, uh, Ward Connolly went before the Board of Regents and made a motion to eliminate the preferences for Board of Trustees members. And he could not get a second. He could not get a second to his motion. They thanked him and that ended it. And they maintained their preferential treatment. And I'll never forget that day because I listened for it to see what the outcome was gonna be at the Board of, Board of Regents. And they wanted to maintain their preferential treatment that they could admit anyone, any of the members of their family, cousins, relatives, or whomever, into the University of California, regardless of what qualifications, or regardless of the test scores or SAT or whatever, and to this day still can. I mean, thank you so much, assembly member. I think it's been really great to have, you know, that like sort of background behind the scenes, political, um, you know, uh, view of what's happening. Um, back to, I, it seems like what was happening in the 90s with the general fear of undocumented um, immigrants coming in and, you know, quote unquote, taking jobs. And now um, what's happening, there's been just like, again, the right time for what's going on. Lydia, do you know uh, why California is only one of nine states? You mentioned that this movement didn't go across the nation, but do you have any insight for why California is one of those nine states? Well, I think the changes in California, both in terms of the demographic changes, were just, you know, tremendously happening here at a higher rate and a bigger change and a much bigger immigrant population. I mean, in 1993, when this was underway, um, whites made up 52.8% of the population that had dropped quite a bit, but 88% of the voters. And that's changed since then. Whites now make up 41% of the population and 55% of the voters. But those big changes, I think really, that's why, it, it, I mean, the, 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 all the moves against immigrants and um, you know, any person of color it happens mostly in places where you just have a lot of change suddenly. And then politicians wanting to take advantage of that change. And Wilson took huge advantage of that change. Um, so those, and those changes are still, it's like California's growing pains, really. Those changes are still going on and those changes, I mean, getting rid of affirmative action has just increased the disparity here. And I mean, Assemblymember Weber is so right that, you know, perhaps this is the time because there are, at all the marches that I've been to in San Francisco have been huge against police violence and have been filled with white people. And that is a very good sign maybe for this proposition. I still think it's a, it's a difficult go. I would be interested in hearing what sort of poll numbers you're getting on the proposition, but um, it's written much more attractively, I think for white voters. I think, you know, as I said before, there is support for this idea of fairness and that's what affirmative action is, just an equal chance at a job, just an equal chance at an education. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's exciting to see so much momentum around this. Like Assemblymember Weber said, there's support from newspapers and caucuses and chambers. So it's exciting. Um, along those lines, we ha do have some questions in our q and I encourage everybody else in the audience to continue to submit them. Um, I'll start with you, Lydia. What are some of the most common misconceptions against affirmative action? And as supporters of the policy, how can we respond? Well, I think the most common, I mean, the most common, you know, used during the last campaign and any, even now, people are still thinking that there are quotas, that if you have affirmative action, we're going to set aside five places for African Americans, five places for Latinos, and we're going to just put anyone in there. And I mean, 
those, those have been, you know, quotas. The Supreme Court spoke, gave its, you know, its um, position on quotas in 1978 with the Bakke case. There are no quotas anymore. There haven't been since then. And the, um, <laughs> the idea is just that, you know, allow people to apply, take their application seriously, look at the whole person. Um, so I think that's the, one of the biggest misconceptions. I think a huge misconception also is that you're letting in a lot of people with really low grade point averages. I mean, the difference before 209 in grade point averages at Berkeley and at UCLA, the most competitive UCs, was about two points. I mean, there was not that big of a difference. It was just you were reading those applications and you know considering the whole person. Um, I think that's another. It's just you know it's misinformation and mis mm -hmm. yeah perception. One of the biggest you know supporters of the biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action early on were white women, because well educated, just no opportunity. And they were, you know, in line and ready to take advantage of it. And then what happened, interestingly enough, in um, 96, when it was on the ballot, white women, these women, the very people who had benefited hugely from affirmative action, um, they began to fear for their sons, that their sons would somehow, you know, be in an unfair competition with someone from, you know, a different kind, a more diverse applicant. Uh, so, yeah. I'll throw the same question over to you, Assemblyman, Assemblymember Weber. What are some of the most common misconceptions that you hear um, that people say to you when you're um, talking about the bill? Many of them think that if, if uh, we take this language out of the Constitution, that basically we will be endorsing discrimination. And so they've tried to uh, put in black communities, oh, they're going to consider race and gender, so they, which means black people are out, uh, you know, because they could be discriminated against. And so we've had to battle that uh, by helping people understand that, you know, those, that, those statements in the, in, the, in, in the initiative did not necessarily bring, uh, bring equality and, and lack of discrimination because that's, that's elsewhere in, in the document and it's embedded in our constitution as well as in the, uh, the state as well as the federal. So, so you know, that's the, one of the big things we're, we're arguing with and dealing with in, in many black communities, but, but we get past that once they see the faces of those who are, who are the endorsers. They, you know, then they realize, okay, this is, this is not gonna be too bad because you know, Kamala Harris, Africana study, or, or Dr. Weber or whomever, or Black Lives Matter are not going to go for this. So therefore that is kind of taken away, but you have to get that message to them that's there, that, that is so really important. Um, and of course, um, you know, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to, it, interestingly to me, to, it's hard to mobilize women, white women, to, to basically think of their self-interest. I mean, you know, it, it, is the, it is the weirdest thing because for years, even when we saw the plummeting of opportunities for women in business in our city, I would say, I would go to meetings and say to white women, you should be outraged. You know, you should be outraged. You should be upset. Nobody's advocating for you and look at what you've lost. And they would all, oh, you know, kind of go around in circles, maybe thinking of their husband, thinking of their son or their, or their brother or whomever, but not really thinking of themselves. And I think uh, at this point now, women are beginning to realize, okay, we've been nice people for a long time. And look at us, we still get less pay, pay than anybody else. We're not getting the opportunities. We're not getting the CEO positions in these corporations. I mean, you know, so we, when women start looking at what they've lost, they should be outraged over the fact that uh, they, they don't have equal opportunity for women and, and the programs and the opportunities are not open for them. So I think that in itself is, is a real challenge. Um, I think as, as we talk about it, uh, it's interesting to me because one of the uh, strongest uh, uh, proponents and continues to be a strong proponent of, of this uh, initiative and, and ACA5 were actually students at the university. Uh, I was amazed uh, when I went to uh, for campus climate meetings, uh, students were pretty clear when I said, well, what do you think I could do to improve the campus climate? They would say, you could, you, if you could, you could get rid of Prop 209. And that was, that was coming from them, that they had studied Prop 209. They saw the impact on their campuses. They wanted a more diverse teaching faculty. They wanted to see people who worked at the university who looked like them, who even were, they were janitors or whatever. They wanted a student population that had much more range, not only in terms of the color of students, but the economics as well, and students who were poor and so forth and so on. So the students were real adamant about, we want to get rid of 209 because we want to have 
a, a campus that looks like the world, okay? Uh, so that becomes important. And of course, always the, the small, right now the Asian population that's supposed to it is smaller than it was back in the day. Uh, because we now have some of the, we have the most prominent Asian elected officials endorsing the uh, Prop, uh, 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 Prop 16, but also we have some of the major uh, business persons who are uh, CC and some others who uh, were opposed to it initially are putting out commercials and things in support because they realize now that one, they did not benefit that much from 209 at all. Their numbers were pretty uh, flat and didn't seem to grow and sometimes even saw decline. But what they also have not seen is as a result of their hard work and their professionalism that they're not being included in the C-suites of this nation, that they're not getting the corporate positions, they're not being the deans of med schools and law schools. And, and despite all of their excellence, they're not being seen as leaders in the, city, in, in the, in the state. They're workers and they're a part of that group, but they have not been a part of the leadership group. And, 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 and that's a part of the, the limitations and sometimes the racism that we place on, on individuals. I, I often tell my colleagues that, uh, you know, you get concerned because the only position that we've allowed Asians to have in California have to do with money. And that's our controller and our treasurer. And, and that feeds into our racist ideas that Asians know how to count, you know? I mean, I mean this, is, this, is, this is real. And so, uh, and so trying to figure out how they, they should be included in other areas, whether it's elected positions or corporate boards. I mean, this is a challenge. This is a challenge to overcome because even when people think they're doing something good for you, they can put you in a box that you can't get out of that box. Uh, and therefore the racism of not allowing you to be something, anything other than uh, that is, is really devastating uh, that's there. And so, uh, uh, so we have to work on all of those elements to make sure that, um, uh, that, that people, all people have access to uh, the kind of education they want, but also the opportunities they want uh, to expand and to grow and to do things that are uh, otherwise. So, um, you know, the numbers, uh, it's, it's interesting, the numbers, we've looked at various polls uh, and I saw the one recently in San Diego uh, that, you know, puts it, I guess, at 40% or something like that. And, and, uh, and then we've looked at, the, I've looked at the other polls that put it 30 some percent. Uh, and then we have to look at, um, uh, we're looking at our messages that are going out and what those messages do and how they change the numbers when people actually understand what's going on. It changes. Uh, my staff went to one of uh, my senior citizen meetings and, and uh, she said over half the people at the meeting were voting against Prop 16. And, uh, and then, then she said to them, you guys know this is affirmative action. You know this is Dr. Weber's bill to bring affirmative action back. And they go, oh, what, we're all, and she said it went from like 40% or 50%, four to 100%. Oh, no, 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 we want that. And so we realized that they, we have to get the message out. And that's why, you know, we've raised a lot of money. The commercials are starting, I think, today. Uh, and they'll be starting next week in, in San Diego to get them. Because once the message is told from the surveys that we've seen, when people really hear, what it's about, they actually, then, then they're in favor of it because it really is about providing equal <clears throat> opportunity for everyone and in helping us to overcome the years and years of racism and discrimination and sexism that is embedded in our society and doing an affirmative action to change those, those initiatives. Um, and so, so our, our issue is one uh, that if we, if, if we get a chance to explain the message, it's clear people are supported. Um, we, uh, we have a, a huge number of, of uh, organizations and a meeting of them the other day, because if our organizations are empowered to move forward and to reach all their memberships and, and, and deal with all of the, the, the uh, things that, that they should do, we should do, you know, we should do well. All the major cities, the mayors are endorsing it, uh, the, the elected officials, the major newspapers, um, all those things are really working in our favor. And so it really is a, an issue and we've raised more money uh, even this week, we raised a, a few more million dollars to basically uh, flood the airways with Proposition 16, and uh, and that will be important. So we're and we've pulled in the celebrities. You know, we've got almost all the celebrities and the athletes and everybody else who's just geared up to start pounding right now till November 3rd to make sure that people know what Proposition 16 is about. They know who who's voting for it, who's in in favor of it. And, uh, and what impact it will have on the life of Californians. We have another question here. Um, what does accountabil accountability look like with Prop 16? How do we track progress? We also had a couple of people say, um, how do we ensure that this does help the Asian American population as well? This is to whom, to me, uh, I, yes. I guess. Oh, okay, how do we track it? 
Well, we track it like we did before. Before Prop 209 came into existence, we had some wonderful tracking systems. Those who put in place uh, various programs, uh, you, you count people, you see how, how well the system is working. You can, in the same way we count people now to see how many are getting in our university, who's in our corporate uh, communities, all those kinds of things. So when a, when a program, when a city like uh, Los Angeles is already gearing up to, uh, in hopes of being able to implement some of the programs they've had in the past, um, when I was on the school board, we got we got annual data with regards to uh, who was being hired, how many people were hired from this group or that group, uh, you know, all those kinds of things, how well our students were doing. That's how we knew about the data based on race and gender. Uh, so you do the counting, you do the information. Um, you look at the data. How do you know Asians are getting their fair share? You look at the data. Uh, if you look at the data now, you will know that they have not, that Prop 209 has not necessarily benefited them that much in terms of education and surely has not benefited them at all in terms of other positions and, and, and leadership positions in, this, in the state and these corporations. So just look at the data, we keep the data. The interesting thing is that the federal government still has affirmative action and, yeah. and therefore it, it still requires data for them. That we have to, when we get money from the feds and we're putting them into roads, we have to have affirmative action data. They, have, they wanna know how many people have we employed, who have we done so and so with? And they can tell you the data. Um, uh, what you do with the data, most of our cities still collect data. That's how we know that it's only 2% women, 2% minorities, those kind of, because people will ask for the data and, and they will ask you, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, how many people do you have employed to do this, that, or the other? That becomes important. And, uh, and when you have access to data, you then realize what programs are effective and ineffective. But that's how you do it. We still have the data. We can tell you right now uh, how many Asians are in our university, how many Asians are in our corporations, uh, whether or not there's been a change. Over, and over time, you see the data that's there. So there's lots of data. It's not hidden information. And, uh, and, and cities and counties that decide to do uh, affirmative action programs do it based on the data that they see. They don't just do it because they want to do it. They look to see where are they falling apart? Where do they, where do they want to grow in certain areas? You know, where do they want to have greater fairness in certain areas? And, and they look at the data. They look at the data and they say, wow, you know, our city is 60% uh, Latino. Uh, our business is only 2% Latino. Why is it that such a disparity that's there? And then they would try to work with those communities and everybody else to hopefully uh, change the narrative that's there with regards and the reality of what is taking place. Yeah, I, just as another point on the data that, you know, before 19, the 1964 Civil Rights Act is passed, not much, you know, an amazing act. It's supposed to bring hiring and equality. Nothing happens. The next year, President Johnson slides into by executive order to take affirmative steps. Still, nothing really happens. And then in 1969 to 72, both Johnson and Nixon, they begin to make everyone that has a federal contact keep the data. And that data allows the government to keep people accountable. So it's not until people are held accountable for right. their numbers that you begin to see changes. And right, we still have the data and now being able to use that data to hold people accountable will be really important. You know, one of the things that was interesting, one of my uh, colleagues from the university who uh, was uh, involved with uh, uh, being at the university long before I got there, he also said one of the greatest beneficiaries of, of one of the folks who, uh, who, uh, of, of affirmative action was actually um, poor white men at the university. And he said, because prior to uh, all the acts and the data collecting and the process, that the way you got a faculty position at a university is that your professor would call that university and get you a job. That, that there was almost no applications. There was no scrutiny of information uh, uh, with regards to that. And most of the time, it was like your, you getting a job because of the school you went to with the professor that you knew. He said, and after that, he said, then they, because they had to have some sense of, of fairness about it, they started an in-depth application process where they looked at people. He said, and interestingly enough, and this is a guy who was at the, at the University of Years, and he's from Indiana, which one of the universities that was basically referring people to, to San Diego State. He said, prior to that, it, you could tell exactly who was coming into those universities to teach but they were coming from certain campuses where the president, where the chair of the department had got his degree and somebody else and somebody else. And they almost didn't even do an interview at all with the persons because they was, it was kind of a gifted thing that they did. He said, and when that happened, and once it stopped, because you had to be fair to women and minorities, 
He said, at that point, the application process came in and all the data collection and therefore white, poor white men who didn't come from the greatest universities, but who were very smart, got a chance to apply and to compete. And he said, so white men should be grateful as well because it opened up a different kind of system of evaluation and application that didn't exist before. Oh, I had a question for you guys already. Oh, here's the other one. Um, so we do know that, you know, uh, federal programs do allow for, you know, preferential treatment for women and minority owned businesses. What happens when um, affirmative action interfaces with California public agencies who receive federal grant money? Are these agencies required to have affirmative action programs for these grants, those that are grant funded projects? I'll give that to you as well, Shirley. You might know about that. <laughs> yeah, they, they are. They're required. I know when, um, even at the state level, when, we, when we're doing things uh, that, are, uh, that have federal dollars attached to it, you also have to keep the data and you have to have an affirmative action program. And those are, those are the, some of the things, if it's road repairs and things like that, that the data is there. And, and, the, and the guidelines for the, the feds uh, will supersede those guidelines that are things that we have at the state level. So yes, affirmative action does apply when you're using, when you're getting federal dollars. And what will happen sometimes, <clears throat> some cities or some places will want to separate the projects so that when one project you have certain guidelines and another project you have something else. But if you get one penny of federal dollars into that other one, you have to have an affirmative action program. Yeah. Awesome, and we are coming up on time here. So we will go with our last question, which is from Vanessa. What is the most succinct response we can give to naysayers who say that affirmative action is reverse racism? We can go ahead and start with you, uh, Professor Chavez. I would say, <laughs> Look, look around your community, look around the place you work, look around the place you're studying and ask, and ask yourself if things are equitable. I, I think the most succinct thing is affirmative action just levels the playing field, tries to level the playing field, tries to give equal opportunity. That's all it's about. And then the same question over to you, Assemblymember Weber. Well, you know, I've never believed there's such a thing as reverse discrimination. Uh, that's number one. You can't have reverse discrimination. Um, offering, uh, and keep in mind that this project or this program or whatever you're putting together is still um, uh, not mandatory. It's still optional. Uh, you know, it's permissive in that sense. Uh, oftentimes it's still run by white men who are running the program. Are they going to discriminate? How can you discriminate against yourself if you decide that you're going to diversify your population and you're going to include others into the project, the program that you have. Uh, so it's no discrimination that's there. Uh, people like to use terms that they can't even define themselves. And reverse discrimination is one of those terms. And when one looks at it, it ab becomes absolutely ridiculous because of who's making the decision. If I decide that I have every, that I have it all, and I want to share some with you, have I discriminated against myself? Probably not. Uh, you know, because I've chosen to do that. And an affirmative action is a permissive. A process that allows cities and counties to improve uh, their workforce, improve the opportunities for everyone that's there, because that's their responsibility as elected officials to try to get everyone in their city engaged and involved and, uh, and benefiting as they talk about trying to address the needs of everyone. So it's, it's a term that's used to get people excited. Uh, they should be more excited about discrimination, period, uh, than anything called reverse discrimination. And they should be totally committed to equity and equal opportunity. You're so right, Assemblymember Weber. Uh, I want to thank both of you um, for joining us today. I honestly learned so much from the conversations with both of you. Um, we will be having a presentation from the Prop 16 team shortly. Um, so some of the questions in the chat box will be answered there. Um, so any last words really fast before we leave? Both. Just start, start <laughs> that I got on late, but I was given information to get on it at, at at 10 20 or 10 15 so no problem but i i, I was following instructions <laughs> no worries it all went okay okay yes thank you so much again i will we will get over uh to jim wonderman again thank you guys thank, well, thank you. you hey uh th thanks so much that was a tremendous and remember uh, weber for the uh, amazing perspective and the leadership that you brought to make this happen uh, and, uh, and, and Lydia, 
uh, Chavez, thank you for uh, giving us that great background, which I think Absolutely. people don't understand uh, so much uh, how we got to where we got. And now we're looking at how to get uh, maybe a bit back toward where <laughs> we were. And I'm sorry, we, you know, it's probably my fault for being a little quick on the draw and getting the panel started, assembly members. So you're on time. We were a little bit, uh, we, we might've been a little bit hasty there. Uh, by the way, Lydia, thanks for the mi Mission Local. Uh, Thank you. Great, great uh, newspaper. And uh, it's pr pretty interesting that that's where we get our uh, investigative journalism from in San Francisco. <laughs> These days is from, from a, a local paper. We're, we're working it. <laughs> they're, they're doing a great job and uh, folks, are, folks are watching and uh, paying attention. So uh, congratulations on that. Uh, you know, this is a very interesting time. The purpose of this, uh, uh, of this summit is in part, uh, you know, understand uh, Proposition 16 and affirmative action. But it, you know, as I said earlier in the program, the, you know, our our organization is highly dedicated to addressing uh, racial justice and racial equity. And so we have a whole number of programs and efforts going on that front. In fact, in every aspect of what we do, whether we're working on issues like education, transportation, uh, housing. Uh, uh, workforce training, what it, no matter what it is, everyone who uh, on the staff who works on the issue is required uh, to have up front on top, not on bottom, how the way we're working on an issue addresses racial equity going forward. Right. Uh, we've taken it, uh, you know, we want to we want to do our part and maybe a little bit uh, extra on that. And uh, you know, we're very very excited about the work. And as I said, the executive committee, the council, when this came up. Uh, it, it, uh, it was supported, Prop 16 supported uh, uh, without any objection. I mean, everybody you know, thought that this was the right thing to do and, uh, and was voted on unanimously by the executive committee, which is made up largely of CEOs of big companies here in the Bay Area. So, uh, you know, we're, you know, the purpose of this and the timing of this summit uh, is informational to a degree, uh, but it's also uh, to, pr to provide some advocacy uh, in favor of Prop 16, and you know, to the question, you know, we, we're hoping that our our members. I know some of our members are contributors to the campaign, and uh, we held a session earlier in our uh, in our uh, diversity and inclusion and equity committee, uh, in which we featured the campaign to you know, kind of get the word out. And right. it's really interesting to hear, uh, you know, and really exciting to hear what Assembly Member Weber said about the campaign and the fact that money is coming in. And I saw a commercial a couple of days ago, and it was very, very good. Uh, and right. I, when people see that, if people see that commercial, they're going to vote for Proposition 16. And so 